and those who are more well educated in the Bible than what I am, you probably have already looked at our gospel lesson from Luke and are going, well, that's not a call narrative as I know it, as I know a call narrative described in the Bible. In fact, it's not even a narrative at all. Because maybe you teach English, even if you're not a Bible scholar, scholar you understand a narrative means it's a story about a person and a person's life. And that's not what Jesus was sharing at all. So you're probably already wondering what kind of limb the pastor's got him out on and the limb half sold off in back of him. Well, hopefully I'm going to try to explain my, my, my way out of it. But uh, today, you're right. This lesson from Luke is not a call narrative. Now, for those of you who, like me, up until a year or so ago, a few a couple years ago, who didn't have a clue what a call narrative was, you're sitting there saying, I don't care, because I don't know what one is anyway. But if you taught English, or you were a good English student, you learned about narratives that I just explained, and a call narrative is a story about how a person was called. Maybe how a person was called to be a teacher. Maybe how you were called to be, you know, a police officer. Many of our jobs we consider callings. I consider it a calling. Maybe they're that call or that story about when you were called to leave your job and go to another one. Maybe it's that call that challenged you to have to leave your neighborhood. And then you have a story about that, and that becomes your call narrative. I have shared that there was that, there was that time that, you know, at the end of 25 years of teaching middle school, there was this call to go to a high school. The one place I swore I'd never teach. I'd only teach elementary, I'd only teach middle, I'd never teach high school. That was my only call. And then there was that call at the end of that, that said, it's time for you to leave teaching the job that you've only known and loved all your life, and it's time to go full-time in clergy. And there will be a point at which there will probably be that call on my telephone, and it will be, hi, I'm Reverend Doctor Whoever, and we really think you should go here or go there. I really don't know what that's going to be. It'd be hard enough to leave any place that I was having a great experience. But in my case, that call, when it comes, if it comes, means I never get to go back to my home church. I never get to go spend a Christmas Eve with my family at their home church again. Sometimes the call of God is a challenge. And for some reason, I just got thinking about that recently. But the idea was that we're going to look for the next four weeks, beginning today, and then the next three weeks, and after that, we're, we're, we're going to talk about Moses, Gideon, and Jeremiah. Now, Gideon is one of those folks that we don't often talk a lot, of, a lot about. You all know a lot about him because he gets around. He travels all around the world. He puts Bibles in hotel rooms. And, 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 and that's probably the, 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 the closest that many of you have gotten to Gideon. And, and, and in case you haven't noticed, you've never seen him do it. He's almost like Santa Claus. He sneaks in and he sneaks out. Well, the other is Gideon's been long dead, folks. It's an association. Gideon himself really doesn't do that. But there's a reason for you. For you, for you to play that. And Jeremiah. So we're looking at this whole idea of their call and then how it relates to our life. Because for seven weeks, we have been talking about who Jesus said he was. And you have no excuses now to not know who Jesus is. I told you at the end of it, it was your call on whether you accept it or not. But it is the call, the most important call you ever make in your life. But in my mind, when I got thinking, so what do we do with this? We now know who Jesus is. The question is, what do we do with it? And it's a call. It's a call. And Moses and Gideon and Jeremiah had a call. And for me, for some of the younger folks in the room, you, you don't remember that guy in the middle. I'm sure. But this is from a Verizon commercial. And he had a line in his commercials that became well-known all over the place. And every time he popped up, he'd whip out his cell phone and he'd say, Can you hear me now? Obviously it worked, huh? We still remember that. And each and every time, he would call and say, 
can you hear me now? Even the boy, if he's on a bus, train, or whatever this is, and he lay the person, the person laying his head in his head, well, there he can do that. This past week in my e-news, or my newsletter, like, 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 like I said, as I told you with the kids, I told a story about a good eye and a bad eye. It's told to me by a man who lived to be 104 in the Western Church. And uh, sometimes we hear the call, but we don't listen. Sometimes we don't hear the call, so we're just not at fault, but we are called. So I want to take a minute and look back at Luke again and see how this fits in, because today we're going to hear about a man who invited people to a banquet. Now, Jesus was telling a parable, and he's telling this parable about, and, and I love the translation that Donald read about, uh, about what it's going to be like to, to, to be in heaven. And my translation is not quite the same as that. And it says, Jesus, he, re, he replied, a certain man was preparing a great banquet and invited many guests. In verse 17, at the time of the banquet, he sent his servants to tell those, listen, to tell those who had been invited, come, for everything is now ready. Now, there's two points there. Invitations had been sent. Now, my guess is they weren't handwritten in the post office. I'm not sure how they sent in the tape 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 tape. But they got out, and they were there. But then there was the follow-up. Not only are we going to do that, but now everything is ready. And because everybody was from small town, we sent our servants out to go tell them that they're out there waiting to come into the party or around that hey, It's time. Come on. Remember that. You had the invitation. So they had heard the call by the invitation. They had received it. And now they were being told to respond. Sort of reminds me, and I shared the story before, when my oldest was um, a, a major of honor to her closest friend who was a graduate of the Naval Academy. And it, it came down to the last week before the invitations were due to be responded to, to all the RSVPs. And they were supposed to be there. And uh, she called my daughter, and she's in a panic because she's got like 30 people, 40 or more, I heard it, I don't know, she had 300 or something. A lot of people who hadn't responded. They had an RSVP. And my daughter said, yeah, I know, because she'd been through it. She goes, well, well, I don't understand. The deadline is next week. Jenny, on that day, when the time comes, we will probably have to, luckily then, take an email, in our case, have to call everybody, back in the dark ages, and ask them, are you coming or are you not? And she goes, well, I don't understand. There's a deadline. She goes, Jenny, not everybody sees that as an order from the lieutenant. Well, but, but, heard the call, but we weren't answering the RSVP. In fact, this past week, I got a little, little email from the DS in a group that reminded all of us who hadn't responded to going to the bishop's event for, tomorrow, for uh, yesterday that there were only 10 pastors out of 71 who had RSVP and made a donation to his cause. So we kind of got notified. So here's the story, it sends them out, and so what happens is in verse 8, or, 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 or verse 18, they all begin to make excuses. Now I know you guys have never done this, but listen to these excuses, because these are like the lamest excuses, like I've got to go rearrange my sock drawer kind of stuff. You know, um, there's, there's a commercial out there now that has those excuses in it, you know, they, 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 they've got to go clean their closet or whatever the case is. It, it, Kind of crazy. So he comes back, he says, the first said, I just bought a field, and I must go see it, so please excuse me. I just bought a field. Well, obviously, you don't want to make the final payment sight unseen. I mean, unless you have just tons of money, and you're buying, you're very trusting the person who's on the other end. But whether you see that field today or see that field tomorrow isn't going to change anything. So you go, well, yeah, he bought a field. He's got, he bought the field. He can go see it whenever he wants to make the final. If he's got cash in hand, the seller's waiting. Trust me. All right? Then another said, I just bought five oxen, five, five oxen, and I'm on my way to try them out, so please excuse me. He's already bought them. They're in the paddock or in the, or in the corral or in the field and great and crazy. They can be tried out today, or you can try them out tomorrow. You already own them. You said so. So there's no getting out of this. Lame excuse too. Now the third one, yeah, you gotta kind of throw this one up in the air. Still another thing. I just got married, so I can't come. 
I said, all the guys in the room were going, yeah, if I leave and I just got married, man, I'm in big trouble. You know, I, I can't do that. So the servant came back and he reported this to his master. And then the owner of the house became angry and ordered his servant, go out quickly into the, into the streets and the alleys of the town and bring in the poor, the crippled, the blind, and the lame. Now, a couple of things here. First, all the other people had heard good idea. <coughs> you should go to this. You accept the invitation. And bad idea saying, ah. It didn't big deal, just take off. Just go up front and drink. Oh, you ought to go. Nah, you know, heard it. So then what does the master do? The master says, fine, you all want to come? I'm going to go invite the poor, the lame, and the crippled, and, and, and all that, because you need to understand those people weren't people. They weren't people. He was, in, he was insulting every person he had invited. It was in your face. I'm going to give all this great food to people who normally get the scraps, we take them out to the, to the street and hand it to them at the end of the party. That's it. So the servant comes back and he says, I did everything, I've got everybody in, they're all here, but there's still more room. He says, okay then. He says, I want you to go out of Jessup, out of Elkridge, and I want you to go into Baltimore, I mean, or out of Baltimore, and out of Washington, I want you to go into Podunk Hollow. said, I want you to go, if Janet was here, I'd say down to Jonesville in Mount Virginia. And I want you to invite the people who live way out in the sticks. And I want you to bring them in because my house is going to be full of people who appreciate what I have and heard my voice and answered. That's why I thought Luke reflects, can you hear me now? Because each and every one of us has a call narrative. We've ignored it, or we've changed it, or we're ignoring it now. But in the next three weeks, as we look at Moses and Gideon and, Je and, uh, Je and uh, Je Jeremiah, I bet you find yourself in, 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 in there. Well, in this time, I, I pleased Jill this week because the, uh, the research I use is from a Nazarene uni the, uh, university. And Point Loma, and she actually knows the university and has relatives up there and stuff, stuff like that. But, doc, but Dr. Bratcher brings us this understanding of what call narratives are. And he said, first of all, there was a time that we all thought a call narrative. It was Vernon's call and my call, that we get these calls and they're real personal. They're really personal. She gets hers and I get mine, and they are personal. But they're completely unique. Nothing related. So therefore, if she's a laser, a lace, a lay minister, sorry, I, I devoted you twice, uh, and, 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 and I'm the pastor, well, that could never be you. But it can be you, because we all started in the same place. And Bradshaw's saying that that's not the case. He said you need to look at it more like a teacher in English, and you got to look at it, and, I, and, and that's one of the things in your handout for the next couple of weeks. This is going to be a lot more like a lesson time than it is like a, oh, come to, come, uh, come to Jesus, shout and, and holler. Because uh, there's points in your faith walk that you've got to learn something about Scripture. All right? Because as you get into the Word, all of that other stuff will take off. So you may actually want to use that handout. Humor the pastor, because he did it. Or as folks would like to say, it's just because I'm still a teacher at Camden. But there. But Bradshaw says that this is a reading, as we read the Bible, read it as what it is. It's a narrative. It's a story about people, and it's about their call. All right? And he says that they have things in common. He said, in fact, the first thing that we would have learned is that there were communities who used these to describe how they believed people were called. So we live at Elk Ridge and Jessup, Columbia, Annapolis, whatever it is here. And this region kind of has a general <coughs> idea of how we think people are called or how things <coughs> happen. We could go outside and, and go to Michigan and maybe it would be different. So what he's saying is that you need to understand when you read this, this was how they described how they believe God called people in their community. All right? Then he goes on and he says... That, that he believes that there are five elements of a call. One, that God calls first. 
one, a situation of distress or crisis in which God confronts a person. I know that almost all of you, if not all, and I've been there, that in, the, in, in a situation of distress and crisis, or whether it be failing a class at school, or in trouble with a bully at school, or being a bully at school, or facing life decisions at 30, or facing life decisions at 80, God has called us in a distress, or has confronted us in a distress situation. Two, the commissioning of the persons for some action or message. In other words, he asks you to do something with that. In your situation, God says, I'd like you to handle it this way. That's your commissioning. You all think commissioning is just for the pastor. It's not. Three, objections raised by the person in the form of inadequacy for the task. Now, I know you guys have used that, because I've done it. But God, you don't understand. I'm not qualified. you got to go call Jamie, because Jamie's got more qualifications than I do. That's just not going to work. What you need to see is that each week, we're going to see that every one of these people experience the same thing. That when we go, but God, not me, not that, they said the same thing. Four, then comes the assurance of God's help. Often in the formula, I will be with you. And you go, yeah, Lord, but I didn't think you were going to ask me to talk to that person. I didn't think you would have asked me to go do that job. And he says, I will be with you. But I'm not qualified. Oops, that's right. That went back to number three. It doesn't matter. Then five, a sign to confirm the commission, often with the context of the, the content of the uh, commission. Now, that's the one you all look at. Yeah, I've never gotten a sign. I've asked God to give me a sign, but he doesn't give me signs. Oh, yeah, he does. Yeah, he does, because you do just what the kids go. Because you don't want to see it. Because you're going, oh my gosh, that's really wow. You know? Sort of sort of like when I was going to leave the middle school. And I said, no, I wasn't going to go. And then a month after that, I was sitting at dinner and found myself talking about what I would do if I was a strength and conditioning coach in high school. And what I would do if I got the coaching job that I thought I was going to get. A month ago, I didn't even talk about it. Okay, God, I see the sign. I could have ignored it. I could have said, oh, that was just something. No, that's it. All call narratives happen. There's five things. So then finally, then we look at these calls of Moses and, and of Gideon and of, Jer of uh, Jeremiah. And Bradshaw said, there's two other things that actually occur. One is leadership of God's people is not something to be sought and cannot be accomplished by the skills and strengths that you already have. Most people are going to go, I'm going to go lead the world to Christ. Didn't start that way. God, God doesn't usually just pull that person out and take them. It's usually somebody in the corner, like David, the youngest child. No one calls the youngest child. God did. God did. Call me. Not a single leader of the Old, Old Testament is, is uh, portrayed, according to Bradshaw, as having in themselves the abilities to be a great leader. Joseph, David, Solomon, and Nehemiah, and Nehemiah, all of them said, can't do it. Not good enough. Not there. But the youngest child was David. And then there was this woman in the Old Testament. I think her name was Deborah. I, I think she sort of did some important stuff and led some people to God. You know, sort of. Uh, but she, she shouldn't have been chosen. She was a woman. Oh, yeah. And there was this wandering, this, this, this Aramaic guy. He was just out, kind of wandering. He was old. And his name was Abraham. <clears throat> yeah, I guess Abraham did something for him. And oh, and we all hate scheming liars. Especially when they scheme and lie against their very own father in law, just so they can get the good look at Jacob. Oh, yeah, his name was Jacob, in case you were wondering. Then become the name Israel. And there was this flat out coward dude we'll learn about in a week or two named Gideon. And then there was this fisherman that. We all just thought it was crazy, and his name was Peter, and they used him. And then they, there was this teenage girl in this town where they were, where people believed that nothing good could come out of Nazareth. I mean, what good could come out of Bethlehem? Oh yeah, her 
name was Mary. Yeah. Yeah, I think she was pretty smart too. God does not call the prepared, he prepares the call. Every one of these individuals just wanted to live for God. Like, like, like you. You just want to live for God. You just want to be there for God. You just kind of want to be Lord. You just want to be your servant. You just want to do it. And he says, in one of those five steps, he calls you out. And then we either go, na 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 na. Or we answer. Finally, in the end, the second thing that Bradshaw says that leadership does directly relates to our skills that we possess, which ties into this. Our skills are not the result of us being successful there. Zechariah 4, 6. A prophet declares, not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, declares the Lord. The basic idea that's expressed in all of these narratives is that God will take us where we are as we are. We've spent seven weeks getting to know who Jesus is. Now we need to spend three to four in making sure we hear the call. You know who it is. The master is calling you to the banquet. You've heard it. You know it. But you want to hang on to the earthly ways. And you want to hang on. Yeah, Lord, I don't want to go that far. I don't want to be that all-in weirdo Christian dude. Man, I just, you know, I just, oh, man, it's going to be so hard. And he says, I'll be with you. And then the next three, the next three, 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 three weeks, I'm going to show you how Moses did, did it, and how Gideon did it, and how Jeremiah did it, did it. Which means how you can do it. That's what you were called to do. For today, come, walk with us in the next three weeks. Come with us and see how much we have in common with those people in the Old Testament who truly have a call narrative. You have one too. Maybe it just hasn't been written to you. Join us singing our next song together.